Hey guys, it's Mrs. Yeagle, and I'm here to read to you the last half of chapter 14. It's called Cornelius Fudge, and I'm starting at the page break on page 257. All students will return to their house common rooms by six o'clock in the evening. No student is to leave the dormitories after that time. You will be escorted to each lesson by a teacher. No student is to use the bathroom unaccompanied by a teacher. All further Quidditch training and matches are to be postponed. There will be no more evening activities. The Gryffindors packed inside the common room listened to Professor McGonagall in silence. She rolled up the parchment from which she had been reading and said in a somewhat choked voice, I need hardly add that I have rarely been so distressed. It is likely that the school will be closed unless the culprit behind these attacks is caught. I would urge anyone who thinks they might know anything about them to come forward. She climbed somewhat awkwardly out of the portrait hole and the Gryffindors began talking immediately. That's two Gryffindors down, not counting a Gryffindor ghost, one Ravenclaw and one Hufflepuff, said the Weasley twins friend, Lee Jordan, counting on his fingers. Haven't any of the teachers noticed that the Slytherins are all safe? Isn't it obvious all this stuff's coming from Slytherin? The heir of Slytherin, the monster of Slytherin? Why don't they just chuck all the Slytherins out? He roared to nods and scattered applause. Percy Weasley was sitting in a chair behind Lee, but for once he didn't seem to make his views heard. He was looking pale and stunned. Percy's in shock, George told Harry quietly. That Ravenclaw girl, Penelope Clearwater, she's a prefect. I don't think he thought the monster would dare attack a prefect. But Harry was only half listening. He didn't seem to be able to get rid of the picture of Hermione lying on the hospital bed as though carved out of stone. And if the culprit wasn't caught soon, he was looking at a lifetime back with the Dursleys. Tom Riddle had turned Hagrid in because he was faced with the prospect of a muggle orphanage if the school was closed. Harry now knew exactly how he felt. What are we going to do? said Ron quietly in Harry's ear. Do you think they suspect Hagrid? We've got to go talk to him, said Harry, making up his mind. I can't believe it's him this time, but if he set the monster loose last time, he'll know how to get inside the Chamber of Secrets, and that's a start. But McGonagall said we've got to stay in our tower unless we're in class. I think, said Harry more quietly still, it's time to get my dad's old cloak out again. Harry had inherited just one thing from his father, a long and silvery invisibility cloak. It was their only chance of sneaking out of the school to visit Hagrid without anyone knowing about it. They went to bed at the usual time, waited until Neville, Dean, and Seamus had stopped discussing the Chamber of Secrets and finally fallen asleep, then got up, dressed again, and threw the cloak over themselves. The journey through the dark and deserted castle corridors wasn't enjoyable. Harry, who had wandered the castle at night several times before, had never seen it so crowded after sunset. Teachers, prefects, and ghosts were marching the corridors in pairs, staring around for any unusual activity. Their invisibility cloak didn't stop them making any noise, and there was a particularly tense moment when Ron stubbed his toe only yards from the spot where Snape stood standing guard. Thankfully, Snape sneezed at almost the exact moment when Ron swore. It was with relief that they reached the oak front doors and eased them open. It was a clear, starry night. They hurried toward the lit windows of Hagrid's house and pulled off the cloak only when they were right outside the front door. Seconds after they'd knocked, Hagrid flung it open. They found themselves face to face with him aiming a crossbow at them. Fang the boarhound barked loudly behind him. Oh, he said, lowering the weapon and staring at them. What are you two doing here? What's that for? said Harry, pointing at the crossbow as they stepped inside. Nothing, nothing, Hagrid muttered. I've been expecting... It doesn't matter. Sit down, I'll make tea. He hardly seemed to know what he was doing. He nearly extinguished the fire, spilling water from the kettle on it, and then smashed the teapot with a nervous jerk of his massive hand. Are you okay, Hagrid? said Harry. Did you hear about Hermione? Oh, I heard all right, said Hagrid, a slight break in his voice. He kept glancing nervously at the windows. He poured them both large mugs of boiling water. He'd forgotten to add the tea bags, and was just putting a slab of fruitcake on a plate when there was a loud knock on the door. Hagrid dropped the fruitcake. Harry and Ron exchanged panic-stricken looks, then threw the invisibility cloak back over themselves and retreated into a corner. Hagrid checked that they were hidden, seized his crossbow, and flung open his door once more. Good evening, Hagrid. 
It was Dumbledore. He entered looking deadly serious and was followed by a second very odd looking man. The stranger had a rumpled, rumpled gray hair and an anxious expression and was wearing a strange mixture of clothes, a pinstripe suit, a scarlet tie, a long black cloak and pointed purple boots. Under his arm, he carried a lime green bowler. That's dad's boss, Ron breathed. Cornelius Fudge, the minister of magic. Harry elbowed Ron hard to make him shut up. Hagrid had gone pale and sweaty. He dropped into one of his chairs and looked from Dumbledore to Cornelius Fudge. Bad business, Hagrid, said Fudge in a rather clipped tone. Very bad business. Had to come. Four attacks on Muggleborns. Things have gone far enough. Ministry's got to act. I never, said Hagrid, looking imploringly at Dumbledore. You know I never, Professor Dumbledore, sir. I want it understood, Cornelius, that Hagrid has my full confidence, said Dumbledore, frowning at Fudge. Look, Albus, said Fudge uncomfortably. Hagrid's record's against him. Ministry's got to do something. The school governors have been in touch. Yet again, Cornelius, I tell you that taking Hagrid away will not help in the slightest, said Dumbledore. His blue eyes were full of a fire that Harry had never seen before. Look at it from my point of view, said Fudge, fidgeting with his bowler. I'm under a lot of pressure. Got to be seen doing something. If it turns out it wasn't Hagrid, he'll be back and no more said. But I've got to take him. Got to. Wouldn't be doing my duty. Take me, said Hagrid, who was trembling. Take me where? For a short stretch only, said Fudge, not meeting Hagrid's eyes. Not a punishment, Hagrid, more a precaution. If someone else is caught, you'll be let out with a full apology. Not as Caban, croaked Hagrid. Before Fudge could answer, there was another loud rap on the door. Dumbledore answered it. It was Harry's turn for an elbow in the ribs. He'd let out an audible gasp. Mr. Lucius Malfoy strode into Hagrid's hut, swathed in a long black traveling cloak, smiling a cold and satisfied smile. Fang started to growl. Already here, Fudge, he said approvingly. Good, good. What are you doing here, said Hagrid furiously. Get out of my house. My dear man, please, believe me, I have no pleasure at all in being inside your, er, uh, do you call this a house, said Lucius Malfoy, sneering as he looked around the small cabin. I simply called at the school and was told that the headmaster was here. And what exactly did you want with me, Lucius, said Dumbledore. He spoke politely, but the fire was still blazing in his blue eyes. Dreadful thing, Dumbledore, said Malfoy lazily, taking out a long roll of parchment. But the governors feel it's time for you to step aside. This is an order of suspension. You'll find all twelve signatures on it. I'm afraid we feel you're losing your touch. How many attacks have there been now? Two more this afternoon, wasn't it? At this rate, there'll be no muggles left at Hogwarts, and we all know what an awful loss that would be to the school. Oh, now see here, Lucius, said Fudge, looking alarmed. Dumbledore suspended. No, no, last thing we want just now. The appointment or suspension of the headmaster is a matter for the governors, Fudge, said Mr. Malfoy smoothly. And as Dumbledore has failed to stop these attacks... Oh, see here, Malfoy, if Dumbledore can't stop them, said Fudge, whose upper lip was sweating now, I mean to say who can. That remains to be seen, said Mr. Malfoy with a nasty smile, but as all twelve of us have voted. Hagrid leapt to his feet, his shaggy black head grazing the ceiling. And how many did you have to threaten and blackmail before they agreed, Malfoy, eh? he roared. Dear, dear, you know that temper of yours will lead you into trouble one of these days, Hagrid, said Mr. Malfoy. I would advise you not to shout at the Azkaban guards like that. They won't like it at all. You can take Dumbledore, yelled Hagrid, making Fang the boarhound cower and whimper in his basket. Take him away and the Muggleborns won't stand a chance. They'll be killing next. Calm yourself, Hagrid, said Dumbledore sharply. He looked at Lucius Malfoy. If the governors want my removal, Lucius, I shall, of course, step aside. But, 
stuttered Fudge. No, growled Hagrid. Dumbledore had not taken his bright blue eyes off Lucius Malfoy's cold gray ones. However, said Dumbledore, speaking very slowly and clearly so that none of them could miss a word. You will find that I will only truly have left this school when none here are loyal to me. You will also find that help will always be given at Hogwarts to those who ask for it. For a second, Harry was almost sure Dumbledore's eyes flickered toward the corner where he and Ron stood hidden. Admirable, admirable sentiments, said Malfoy, bowing. We shall all miss your uh, highly individual way of running things, Albus, and only hope that your successor will manage to prevent any killings. He strode to the cabin door, opened it, and bowed Dumbledore out. Fudge, fiddling with his bowler, waited for Hagrid to go ahead of him. But Hagrid stood his ground, took a deep breath, and said carefully, if anyone wanted to find out some stuff, all they'd have to do would be to follow the spiders. That'd lead them right. That's all I'm saying. Fudge stared at him in amazement. All right, I'm coming, said Hagrid, pulling on his moleskin overcoat. But as he was about to follow Fudge through the door, he stopped again and said loudly, And someone will need to feed Fang while I'm away. The door banged shut and Ron pulled off the invisibility cloak. We're in trouble now, he said hoarsely. No Dumbledore? They might as well close the school tonight. There'll be an attack a day with him gone. Fang started howling, scratching at the closed door. All right, that's the end, guys. See you next time.